Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Victoria DeGrazia. Today we'll be discussing her book project, Irresistible Empire, America's Advance Through 20th Century Europe. Welcome to Rip Rap, Victoria. Thank you very much. This brilliant book examines the way the United States promoted the peaceful conquest of the world, including Europe through the rise, as you say, of a great imperium with the outlook of a great emporium. I really like the way you did that. Or what you call the market empire. How did this project develop and how does examining the elusive force of consumer culture fit in the context of your larger research objectives? Thank you. Well, I am a European historian by training and the idea came to me when I was working on fascism in Europe and Italy. Italian fascism and fascisms generally are considered to be closed systems. Particularly, they were closed toward American culture. That's what they said, closing it out as materialistic, hybrid, Jew-ridden. So I was very struck in the early 1930s to find that the film Gold Rush came to Italy, Charlie Chaplin, and it had an enormous audience, an audience of four million people, the biggest of any film ever, and Mussolini at that point said, we need our own Italian film industry, which then became Cinecittà, what some people called the Hollywood on the Tiber. So I said, if under these circumstances, this American presence is so strong, well, what's going on? <laughs> what's, what's happening? So that was the beginning of going back to the U.S. and then going back to Europe and trying to find out uh, the nature of what I came to call um, a market empire, uh, empire uh, that was based not on putting your hands down on colonies, but rather working through um, uh, the, the influence of the market. And how the whole process of business and expansion worked. Right. I don't, it's you know, um, abroad, sometimes called Americanization, and there's been a huge debate where cultural imperialism gets tossed around in Europe. It's a problem for the whole world, not just for the Europeans. The Europeans, uh, certainly beginning in the 20s, felt it in a particularly strong way because they were very, very experienced imperialists. And all of a sudden, they saw the arrival of goods and ideas and these images, particularly you know, the Hollywood actresses, the Hollywood uh, uh, divas. And they began to throw around that word cultural imperialism for the first time. So it's a much longer history uh, that I'm looking at, trying to understand in terms of Europe, what was the impact of this America, but in the process having to go back to the United States and to understand you know, when's the caring power? How did uh, this consumer culture uh, package itself in the American context? so that it could move abroad. So it becomes a very complicated story, which then has to be worked out so it becomes clear of how America saw Europe as the great hegemon, how America began to assert its, its muscle, its hegemonic power, especially through these new uh, consumer cultures, how then in turn the Europeans began to uh, look at that challenge to uh, struggle against it, accept parts, refuse parts, find alternatives. So it, in some ways, it's, it's about a struggle of hegemons across the North Atlantic, uh, sometimes today abusing the term. It's called the clash of civilizations. We can go that direction afterward, uh, and what could be meant by that. But it is very, very powerful to see the, the, the rise of the US as a global hegemonic power had to pass through uh, confronting uh, European commercial civilization and overcoming it, uh, move through Europe, and then also move through Europe's uh, colonies eventually. And I see it as a very long process to start in the late 19th century when the growth of American uh, consumer culture is on a very big scale, uh, and then to, to see this confrontation as Europe falls apart, uh, is unable to offer a decent standard of living uh, unable to offer a, a, a unified consumer culture that could uh, be an alternative to the American, and then the story continues after World War II. 
and in some ways the story still continues today, but we'll perhaps come back to that. Well, I thought it was interesting how you picked up on how extensive this was. This wasn't just something like you're saying, it dates all the way back to the early 1900s and before and, and, and the development. Yeah, I, I tried to understand it on an economic level, a political level, a cultural level, and I say economic level, it's often argued that America conquers uh, because of its huge size and the huge scale of its industries. The, the McDonald's is so the biggest fast food and the first one, Hollywood. It's the biggest and it's the most um, organized uh, American advertising. But the question is, you know, how did it get so big within the United States? Uh, how did it become so uh, capable of getting you know, of, of its vitality. So yes, economically, it's in a big protected market. Politically, it's a remarkable the amount of support the US government uh, gives to its export cultural industries, as well as other industries as well, but very uh, interlinked with the, uh, in the film lobby and the American Department of Commerce and the Bureau of Foreign and Domestic uh, Politics, how much American uh, was very worried about public opinion and therefore very interested in promoting its, a vision of its commercial culture and culture generally uh, abroad. And then finally, it's above all, it's a cultural question. I begin to see, well, this American culture, where does it come from? Well, most of the entrepreneurs are coming from abroad. Many, let's say in Hollywood, are uh, Jews from Central Europe where they had the problem of crossing borders, mixing it up. They know how to merchandise because that was very well, the trades in which they found themselves so coming to America. They're very aware of how to cross borders with culture. The US itself is a very mixed country, but not just because of all the peoples, which you'd have to get to, uh, the ethnicities that you want to reach or not, as, you know, but also by region. So to make the market here, you, you, you had to amalgamate a, a culture, synthesize, uh, make it a, a very strong culture, develop genres which would travel, and then remarkable feedback systems from abroad, which are then new by 1920, let's say, in the film industry, uh, that uh, their profit came from exporting. They made costs, remade costs on the American market, closing out other industries. That was a very important part. The French were dominant up until about 1907. And then uh, they want feedback. And so they develop uh, American film industry, but then this is true for other consumer cultural industries, uh, have an ear listening to uh, how to get those publics abroad. So it's quite remarkable the amount of procedure which is developed in this country, and then a belief that if it's good for this complicated American uh, system, uh, consumer and all this her diversity, as if she really is, that's not how they really are, then it can be universal. And it's a remarkable assumption. It comes too out of the Midwest. I, I was surprised how much of this inventive invention comes from the Midwest. I think, of course, Henry Ford, Midwest, Detroit, uh, Rotary Club, Chicago. Uh, there's a lot of practices that come out of trying to be you know, part of this very big uh, national uh, culture, national market. And that gives it immense carrying power. And then there was a very clear project, too. These Europeans, they're uh, culturally conservative. They have the poor masses whom they don't give enough to. Uh, they're very low standard of living. They're cartelists. They're monopolists, unlike us. We believe in free trade. They have their closed empires, which means provincial cultures. So, you know, I found so remarkably in Woodrow Wilson, but then it continues this notion that in an open world, the Americans will triumph, and then the Americans represent this new open world based on a, as I call it, a, 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 a market empire, raise the standard of living, open up all the barriers, and we'll have you know, a, new, a new world of, of, of brotherhood and democracy. So it, they regard it as a progressive project, uh, which then they delegated very much to the forces of the market. That, that's, that's a fascinating story. It becomes a story, yes, of a progressive idea, uh, but at the same time, it's a story which says other people's sovereignty, well, what is it? 
the market is yeah, the basis. Was, that was something I found fascinating. You have these five features of the market empire, which I like the fact that you fleshed this out. But the first and fundamental one was that they re didn't regard other nations as having, they had, they viewed other nations as having only limited sovereignty over their public space. You could almost say it's rather arrogant, but it was a fundamental way that they handled this. Oh. And there's this carryover now to Ex foreign policy. Very you think, strong. Oh, my God, oh, very strong. I, I mean, let's say nothing was invented today. <laughs> you know, it's an old idea. I mean, if you probably go back to Adam Smith, and that's basically the, there's a notion, you know, the market should go as far as it can go. But it's very important that moment where you say, uh, we, it's not just a market for goods, but we know that goods have values in them. Adam Smith did never say that. <laughs> and this recognition that if a film comes, it's not just a product. It's carrying values. Advertising. The advertisers know very well. It's not about project products. They've got values. So at that point, you're raising a very fundamental question. Because other countries, we know, it's accepted, their sovereignty is based on some sort of control over their pub public space. Uh, we definitely recognize it in the US, and the Americans were very aggressive about closing out foreign cultural uh, Im importers, uh, say, Pathé film industry. And you know, still today, the American market is very close to alien uh, cultural products. So now uh, you know, we talk a great deal about multiculturalism and so many of our products are made abroad. But if they came carrying very strongly foreign culture, uh, the, the tendency would be to, to fight, fight against it. In, in any case, that becomes a very fundamental point uh, to say uh, that uh, we need an open market. And that's what the US continues to struggle about when it wants world trade agreements, to say, no, uh, cult all cultural barriers uh, should be dropped as well. Uh, there's nothing sacred. And now one's getting a stronger argument being made. Unfortunately, it was first associated with the French, and we know how much anti-French sentiment there is in this country. But the French uh, and others are saying, well, you can't have a society unless there's some way that the solidarity underlying that society, which comes in its cultural means, has some chance to hang together. And therefore, uh, cultural products should be treated in a different way. Uh, not always, uh, but uh, it should be some, it's something to be negotiated. I thought one of the other interesting things you picked up on uh, the features of this market in, uh, empire was the export of civil society. And you were talking before about oh, Rotary and yeah. how these voluntary associations form kind of a, a foundation for this process. Uh, it's, it, it's fascinating. I mean, the U.S. is a very, as we know, a very active uh, civic culture, and uh, it, it, it's, it's played a very important role in Americans, especially in corporate America, going abroad. But there's always some notion that you had to, should be uh, picking up on what's going on locally, because that's the way you make market. But when the American army goes abroad, uh, it's classically in Europe, at least in this high point, the 60s, uh, you know, you'd find colonels who would set up choir societies to try to involve the locals and to make it, you know, much more settled. Uh, you know, not just the army, but we're also part of a peacekeeping mission. Uh, the, uh, so, so there is a, a sense that all of these commercial cultural products should be carrying with a sense of the accessibility of American society. That uh, this is the kind of product that in America the tree surgeon would like, uh, the socialite representing women, the bank manager goes with these kinds of figures. That this is about uh, inter uh, uh, mixed society. Now, of course, it doesn't talk about what it doesn't include, which you know, large parts of the American poor, people of color, uh, and women who are not uh, so socialized. But that's that was very important. It was procedures that create association. And so Rot Rotary's signal in this uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, Rotary today is an international organization. It's getting a big new wind because it's no longer 
affect American bases. It is truly a global organization. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. The acme of this American expansion does include this sort of the vitality of American uh, civic life. Another feature was the promotion of the democratic ethos. You know, that this is the way to go. So I found it's a very restricted notion of democracy. It's a democracy of a recognition that you and I both have the same T-shirt on. No, we don't happen to have the same T-shirt on, but it's that you know, you know, Wilson's idea, but then he's picking it up too from advertisers, is if we recognize each other physically, that will allow us to communicate. And so if we go to the same Rotary Club or if we could both have access to soap, uh, that's an old idea. If we, uh, you know, both were it had our Ford car, then it allows us to cross class. And this was very important because, with respect to Europe, it was very stratified uh, and to an exceptional d degree, and that created a kind of status lines, which were a cause of, you know, deep uneasiness, and a sense of deep inequity. So the Americans are proposing a very narrow conception of democracy, but it's one that says everybody should have the right to access to a certain kind of standard of living, and that standard of living is by everybody having some income, decent income, to buy a certain set of goods. I'm trying to say this is not you know, democracy when we talk about bringing democracy to Iraq, uh, though I think that that very limited notion that everybody could then have uh, you know, T-shirts and uh, access to MTV was was that minimal notion, uh, and this this is an important as a challenge to to notions of democracy within Europe were based on uh, uh, redistribution, uh, which is very radical, uh, or a no, a, a notions of democracy which did take into account that people had shared access. Well, it seemed like it was a less complex concept. Very, very, very not, minimalist. Yeah, it did not take into account what you need in order to have a true democratic interaction. Exactly. It, it, it does not. It ignores that. It says, look, if we can both smell the same, okay, and we uh, but we're, and, and both treat each other as human bodies uh, who are communicating because we, you know, we have a similar kind of flush toilet. We have a similar kind of a kitchen sink, a similar kind of automobile, then the world will be a better place. And there is something to it, especially if one does not have the, the, the divides. And, but this was a very, this is a very material American notion you know, coming out of the early 20th century. You know, in the 1950s, it could be projected and there could be these very sharp debates, you know, the Khrushchev-Nixon debate. We, uh, you know, we have our kitchens, our women, uh, we take care of our women, and Khrushchev says, well, why, we don't want to shove our women into the kitchen. We want our women to be out working and be equal uh, to our men. And the kitchen, well, it should be collective. It's a very different notion of, of what quality. Well, I think you picked up on the fact this is a marketing strategy. This is a, a counterpoint to the European realities. And so in that way, that's what gave it the real edge. Right, it know. was. It was you know, it, it's, it's so interesting that you could have some deep in a marketing strategy the notion they're talking about liberty, equality, um, and uh, uh, fraternity. We're talking about a notion of liberty uh, and democracy, which is based on the equality that comes from having access to the market. The inevitable question is, what now? with this market empire. And we've already started talking about ways that this coming apart as you talk about some of the ruptures that can, you know, are easily lost to sight. And, and as I was reflecting on the book, you know, Ford Motor Company just today announced yeah. these huge layoffs. Yeah. Like 75,000 hourly employees, 14,000 white, I mean, just, just and, and at the same time, they're talking about having lost something like $6 billion this year you know, deficit. Um, and that was one of the great economic forces that helped run the market empire Absolutely. with Fordism. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's 2006, so it's like a hundred year cycle. 
1906, probably 1907, that Ford begins to move away from the pack. Uh, and the assembly line isn't until a few years later. So it's 100 years, and that's roughly how I see it in the book. Uh, probably a little shorter than that. Ford should have laid off these when you know, GM started. And it's in, in the 90s that the American clearly ceases to be the center of global manufacturing, maybe even earlier, you see signs in the 1970s, and that all of the elements which made the uh, Imperium as Emporium begin to become unpacked, I mean, abandoning in the 70s the notion that the U.S. stood for a rising standard of living for everybody anywhere in the world. That was a very key uh, point. The decline of the U.S. as a manufacturing center which could afford high wages. Very, very important uh, element. The rise of China as a major area of production, very important. And then finally, we're, we're getting the dec visible decline of the American standard of living, which Hurricane Katrina showed to the whole world that how low the American standard of living is on, on, on numbers of criteria. And the Europeans clearly now having a very high one. But above all, it's this war uh, that has coalesced in my mind that we're in a different epoch. Uh, the invasion of Iraq uh, with the fiction that the Iraqi would then rebuild uh, using their own oil, which would then be exported to us, that immediately the market forces would move in and the Iraqi would start buying and selling these goods, that you knock down that closed empire of Saddam, and once it opened up, uh, you know, things would all fall into place. And you know, the Americans, are, are, you know, like our, our US government is left in a very peculiar situation that it thought that if you just knock down the walls, the market empire would move in, and it would become a place that's congenial. And instead, it's faced with having to set up a colony, which is not an American tradition to do, because it involves you know, a lot of engineering. So it's nowhere. It's not uh, the old traditional colony. It's not the Marshall Plan, which planned using European traditions of planning and spent huge amounts in a very targeted way to build up nations and markets. and. There is only the most ingenuous notion of what democracy is, the most uh, uh, shriveled notion, which is about materialism, uh, which just drives fundamentalist Islam crazy, because it's so little uh, to, uh, uh, to latch on to. Yeah, I thought it was in line with what you're talking about, because if you don't do the research on your target, market. You can misread it. Deeply. And Deeply. if you don't have Deeply. informants, I guess you would say, in that market, you can re and this is evidence there, there, of what happens if you don't have a strategic. It's, it's, yes, it's just, but it's, it's remarkable. There's no way now that they're ever going to be able to get information on that society. It's a society at war. It's unfortunately, also at war with itself, but that was has, goes with the with the terrible game. So now these efforts to go back to soft power, in which um, Condoleezza Rice as a Secretary of State, she's trying to reinvigorate this Under Secretary of State for public diplomacy. And what are they trying to do? They're selling. It's a selling model. But the selling model then doesn't have any feedback. I just kept thinking, that's a big whoops. <laughs> You know, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. And there's just, there needs to be a lot more work, strategic planning about how you're going to handle that. Your book does help us make sense, as you say, of the distinctive traces of the market empire. And it's an exorbitant decline. As <laughs> much as we may mourn it, it, it's there. It's a different world. It's, it's a world which is very hard for many Americans to understand where there are centers of extraordinary well-being elsewhere, 
Western Europe is extraordinary, but there are pockets of extraordinary middle class well being in Eastern Europe now. Goodness knows, Greece. Extraordinary in places, other places in the Balkans and Eastern Europe. Uh, Chinese middle classes are huge. Uh, the, you know, the, much of the country is poor, and uh, there are emerging different kinds of models. None of them have what the U.S. has. The great size of the American market, clearly, but uh, the, the huge military capacity. So. The U.S. is not going away, but the basis on which it had this extraordinary persuasive power, that is deeply, but deeply eroded. Yeah, um, this glorious vision, this glorious performance. Well, uh, yeah, and it was a performance on many levels, yeah. so it did have uh, some caring power. Sure, much to be contested by others. Very, most varied in its faces, because the face to be sure, toward Latin America, has been always riddled with heavy-handed militarism uh, from the Philippines. But toward Europe, it particularly, it had this extraordinary challenge, which was based on being the premier uh, consumer civilization. And it, you know, you could, one can understand why it should have been so powerful in the period. And this is something that I think Europeans, too, this is a book, no, no, be preachy, gosh, no, it's toward, toward, toward the United States. It's also a book that Europeans are reading and to try to understand that, uh, you know, what indeed they did not do during the first half of the century and why that the U.S. is not based on imperialism. It was based on presenting itself as a hegemon. Hegemon means that it is a way of a possibility that many layers of the a country can latch on to working people as well as elites, and the U.S. did did offer that uh, in, uh, in many ways. And I think it's very important to understand why the U.S. was strong, but also how it could be lose that extraordinary uh, if you want, the charisma, the commodity which it had in the, in, through much of the 20th century. Well, I think it's a brilliant book, and I thought I really enjoyed the fact that the, it had. A true multiplicity of approaches and perspectives in, in, in working this through in a long view, as they say, in studying history. So thank you for being on the thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.